My Lord, what, what a, an audience I am confronted with. <laughs> I assure you, uh, I would be much more relaxed if I had the Pope and the Cardinals in front of me. <laughs> because uh, in this, this occasion, I can speak Italian. Uh, don't forget that this is a poor Italian trying to speak English, so forgive me all my mistakes. Let me share one, just one episode with my relationship with John Paul II. Once a year, the preaching to the papal household takes place in the St. Peter's Basilica on Good Friday. It's the only occasion where the Pope presides over the liturgy but doesn't speak, doesn't give the homily. No, the papal preacher is supposed to give the homily. Maybe some of you may have seen sometimes because it is broadcasted alive. Now, the first time in, back in 1980, I had to, to give this homily. As, as soon as I started preaching, I realized that I had to speak very slowly because there was a, a resounding in the basilica. Speaking slowly, I lasted 10 minutes more than I was supposed to do. <laughs> and the man in charge of the timetable of the Pope, and he's a cardinal, he's, uh, later on was a cardinal, was rather nervous, anxious. He often looked at his watches because uh, uh, that day the Pope has a very tight schedule. He must preside over the way of the cross and the Colosseum. I didn't see him because he was beside me. But the day after, this man <clears throat> told to, to some sisters what had happened after the liturgy. After the liturgy, the John Paul II called him and smiling said to him, when a man of God is speaking to us, we should not look at our watches. <laughs> so take it as a warning. <laughs> Although I don't I, I don't think I will take advantage of, advantage of your patience. <laughs> in life, in the life of every person, there are moments and rites of passage. The baptism is one, birth and bat, bat, baptism, marriage is another, and of course death is another moment of passage, the last one. <clears throat> Now, I think, dear, dear students, that graduation is a moment and a rite of passage for you. You have you are finished your training, your formation, now, now you start a new stage in your life. And I have tried these two days uh, when I was staying here in Stubenville, I have tried to imagine, to enter in your heart and try to discern what are your expectations and your great desires while you are beginning this new step in your life. And I think there are two great desires in your heart, two great, great expectations. One is about achieving something good, valuable in life success. And the other is to enjoy happiness and maybe help us, help other people to, to be happy around you, spouses, family. Now, what I want to, to say to you there, students, is that Jesus is the best alive in achieving these goals in life. Uh, first of all, let us say something about uh, success, achieving something great in life. The great philosopher and believer, Pascal, has a, a thought which can be very illuminating. He says that there are three orders of greatness in the world. So you can be successful in three different orders or levels. There is, first of all, the level of bodies, or the physical level, and in this 
level are great, outstanding. People who are rich possess many, many goods. People who are strong, so the athletes, and the sportsmen. And people who are beautiful, so the film stars. They are great in this first field. There is another level of greatness, says Pascal, which is infinitely higher than the, the first, and it is the level of genius, of intelligence. And in this level are outstanding artists, scholars, scientists, poets, and usually men stop at this age. They, these are the only two possibilities of, of fame and greatness that they know. Pascal says there is a third level, which is more high, higher than the second, than the second is higher uh, in relation to the first. And it is the order of holiness. Holiness. In this order, Jesus <clears throat> is the summit, then the Blessed Virgin, the saints. Why is this third level unknown to the world, the most important one? First of all, because it, it uh, lasts forever. It's not a greatness which uh, ends with this life. But moreover, there's another reason. Because only in this order, you can fulfill your destiny, your vocation. Only in this order you can achieve self-fulfillment. To understand what I mean, it is enough to, to, to follow me for a, for a very short reasoning. According to philosophers, human beings are nature. Nature. Which means they are what they are best determined to be by their birth. Therefore, we are defined rational animals. According to the Bible, human beings are, are not so much nature as vocation, which means they are not so much what they are determined to be by their birth as what they are destined to become by the use, the exercise of the free will in the obedience to the word of God. Which means that our vocation is to be in the image and likeness of God. This is our, our destiny, our vocation, what we, we are supposed to, to be. So the contrary of holiness is not sin. It's failure. Failure, <laughs> failure, because this is the goal God has, has uh, stated for every human being. Unless we reach this goal, we are uh, failed. But even practically, we can see that the, all, the holiness is the only universal uh, greatness. Uh, the saints have changed not just history, they have make, made history, but they have also changed the geography. If you look at um, how many cities are named after the saints, you in America, you have San Francisco, San Antonio, and so many others. Once I happened to be in California in a, in a seaside resort called Capestrano. Capestrano. Maybe some, some of you will uh, go there. Now, this is a very, very fashionable seaside resort in California, so they took me to see this place. Now, Capestrano is the name of a very tiny village in Abruzzi in Italy, which nobody knows in Italy. But because this village produced the sand, San Giovanni da Capestrano, this village has become, has given a name of a very beautiful seaside resort. Yes, look uh, closer to us. John Paul II. John Paul II has achieved great goals in life. Great, immense goals. But his highest greatness is holiness. 
holiness. He is praised and he will he, he now the only greatness which <laughs> still endures for him is his holiness. And I can assure you that he was really a holy man. Staying close to him, I could see him uh, before and after every talk. And he uh, seemed always to be in dialogue with an invisible interlocutor. And he was so patient, so humble. I speak quite uh, willingly of my job of, as papal preacher because it, it tells more of the Pope than of the preacher. Imagine the humility of a Pope coming to listen to the sermon of a very simple priest of the Catholic Church. And he never missed the sermon. Once he missed two sermons because he was traveling around Central America, and when he came back the next time, he went straight to me, apologizing for having missed two sermons. So sometimes I say, I say to my brothers around the world, did you ever go to your parish priest apologizing for having missed the, the homily of the la last Sunday? <laughs> the Pope does. <laughs> what is the condition? Uh, First of all, the good news there, their students, the good news. The good news about uh, these three levels of greatness is that you are not obliged to choose between one of these three levels because holiness doesn't exclude the other. This is the incredible privilege of being holy. You can make, try to make money. You, you, you are allowed to try business to become a film star or a poet while striving for holiness because holiness is open to any, any vocation. The only condition is that you, you use your talents, your knowledge, not just for yourself, for my, just to make money, live a comfortable uh, life, but also for the others, and especially, first of all, for the glory of God the glory of God, and service of others. This is the, your truly vocation. Exploit your talents in putting them at the service of the Father. Uh, a philosopher Nietzsche fought Christianity precisely because Jesus said, whoever wants to be the first must be the last and servant of all. He said this means to introduce a cancer in humanity and discouraging people for uh, wanting to, to do great things in, in, in life. But he was completely mistaken. Jesus says, if anyone wants to be the first, therefore it is allowed to, to, to want to be the first. Jesus only changed the way. He said, not oppressing the other, crushing the other as Hitler did, following following the, the, the ideology of Nietzsche, but putting yourself at service to enhance the others. And see, Mother Teresa kneeling down is very, for nowadays is blessed by, by all the, the world. On, on the contrary, the man who achieved the, the ideology of Nietzsche is deprecated by all the world. Now, about... Uh, what does it mean to be holy? What does it mean? This is a universal call, not just for your students, but also for me and for all. We are called to... Uh, and it's quite natural that we ask, what does it mean to be holy? And the answer oh, is very encouraging. Holiness is not to be achieved. No, no. It's already there. It's already there. In the Old Testament... Holiness consists in getting in touch with God. In the New Testament, holiness means to get in touch with Jesus because Jesus is the holiness of God made flesh. So we are called to 
take advantage of, 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 the, of the holiness of Jesus. The sacrament, the word of God, are means by which we can appropriate the holiness of Jesus. This is what I call the bold stroke in life. And I should like all the people present in this hall to make this bold stroke before dying. Because Christianity is about that. Every other religion starts telling people what they must do. Duties. Either intellectual speculations or ascetic works. Christianity doesn't start telling people what they must do. It starts telling people what God has done for them in Christ. So Christianity is religion of grace or oh, of amazing grace. Yes, there are, there are duties, there are commandments. But the order of commandments in Christianity is the second one, not the first one. Higher than the level of commandments, the Ten Commandments, the precepts of the gospel, canon law and monastic rules. Before the order of the, uh, of the uh, commandments, there is the order of gift, of gift. When I preach in Rome, in Rome, as in many big cities, there are homeless people, beggars, who possess nothing except their dirty rags. And I, I use this image. An image that one day a voice spreads that in Via Condotti, Via Condotti is like the, the seven streets in, street in uh, in New York, the, the, the street of, of a boutique of fashion. Is the seventh street in New York or what? Fifth Avenue. Fifth Avenue. Fine. <laughs> so this is for in Rome called Via Condotti. Imagine that in Via Condotti there is a, a owner of a boutique who invites all these homeless people, all these beggars in his boutique, and invite them to put uh, off their dirty rags, take a shower, and then choose the best suit they can see and go on freely, freely. People react, of course, the, the saying, this never happens. <laughs> yes, but I, 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 I add, this is what can happen every day with God. We are these beggars with dirty rags on us. And any time we approach the sacrament of confession or the Eucharist, we, are, we, are, we put off these rags and we are clothed with the beautiful mantle of righteousness. So once, when I came to Steubenville the first time, or oh, it was in the late 60s, uh, I imagine, I knew hardly a few phrases in English. So, and I had to, to, to address the priests in English. And I want to convey to them the idea of this bold stroke. And somebody translated what I meant uh, here in Steubenville, saying, well, what corresponds to what, you are, uh, to what you have in mind is maybe the bold of genius, a stroke of genius. A stroke of genius. Yes, this is a stroke of genius. And don't allow you to end your life without having done this stroke of genius in your life. Let me say something much shorter about happiness. About happiness. Because for young people, this is a crucial issue. And unless our faith gives you reason, gives you hope to enjoy happiness, you will find faith unable to face the challenges of the world around you. Before going on, can you understand my, my poor English? Can, oh, fine, fine, fine. So Jesus, Jesus has brought a revolution about joy and happiness. And we must take notice of this revolution. In human experience, this experience has been expressed in in the literature, in art, everywhere. There is always this relationship. First pleasure, then pain. This has been a common uh, observation. There is a, 
a, a link between pleasure and pain. The most striking is, example is drug. Drugs gives you a moment of excitement, pleasure. They say it's a great pleasure. I don't know. Uh, but the, then let, they let you down. The same with the, 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 abu the abuse of sex gives a pleasure with ends in pain. Two, there, two years ago, I was in Spain, in Madrid, and there was a show going on. Uh, the title of this show was The Tears of Eros. You know what Eros is. Eh? And the show was about all about paintings, statues, which uh, express this link between Eros and Thanatos. Eros and Thanatos, which means between erotic love and death. Now, Jesus has reversed this, uh, the, this order, and in, in, instead of a pleasure which leads to pain, he proposes a pain which leads to joy, happiness, and an happiness which lasts forever. So the last word is in, the, in Jesus' mind is happiness. And we can see in the Paschal mystery we have just celebrated this order. First, Good Friday, death, then resurrection. Then there is joy. Even the, in the way we calculate the time reflects this biblical uh, order. In our normal uh, uh, reckoning of time, we, uh, the unit, a unit is composed by day and the night. Hmm? The day and night. According to the Bible, it's the contrary. The unit is night and day. You remember the, 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 this beginning of the Bible? And it was evening, it was, uh, it was uh, day, first day. It was evening, it was day. What does this mean? Even the liturgy, you know, for the liturgy, the day becomes with, uh, starts with the, the vesper, the, the evening before. What does this mean? It means that a life without God, without faith, concretely without Jesus, is a day which ends in night. And a life with Jesus is a night which ends in day and a day without sunset. You may know that uh, a few years ago in London there was an atheistic campaign led by Richard Dawkins who produced a slogan, a slogan which was uh, put on the buses of London and in other uh, European cities. And the slogan uh, uh, went like this, God probably doesn't exist. So stop worrying and enjoy life. Now, the most dangerous element in this slogan is not the premise, God doesn't exist. Because this is an opinion. God probably doesn't exist. You can't <laughs> demonstrate that. Uh, the most dangerous element is the, the, the conclusion. So enjoy life. Because this implies the idea that faith is the enemy of joy. And this is a big lie. You, you young people, you must show that this is a lie. That with Jesus there is plenty of joy. Only with Jesus there is real joy in life. So you... You go out with a diploma, with a certificate. Huh? This is important. It's a key for, for some, uh, some, in some occasions, but it is not enough for life. You need another certificate. You need the Holy Spirit. This is the key. This is the key. Has been the key for me. Has been the key for me. I used to be a professor like all this behind me for many years. Uh, at the Catholic University of Milan, then when uh, the Holy Spirit touched me in a special way, I renounced, not because I despise teaching position, this is a blessing, it's a way, it's a blessing, has been a blessing for me, but I left uh, uh, the teaching position for something for me more important, especially as a priest, preaching the word of God. I didn't know at that moment where I I 
should start preaching the kingdom of God. I, uh, I learned that it was Vatican, the Pope. <laughs> and this is what I still am doing after 32 years. And if, if you allow me, the first time I meet Benedict XVI, I will convey to him your greetings, embracing him on, your, on behalf of all the people of Steubenville. Thank you. <laughs> Take courage, take courage, young people, take courage.